Hello, it is I, Derek from Tomcat Gas Training, and welcome to part two on all trainee gas engineers need to know about appliances and their flue systems. Part one was on flueless ones if you haven't seen it. But before we start on this video, please could you take some time to subscribe because it helps my channel. And don't forget to hit that notification bell because you want YouTube to tell you when we're uploading videos. Hopefully I don't need to tell you it's Mondays and Wednesdays. Now I've waffled enough and this video is going to be a long one, so let's get on with it. Now, according to the standards, we uh, now classify flues as A, B or C. A is um, flueless, B is open flued and C is room sealed. So we're going to look at type B appliances, open flued. So we can have open flued boilers, we can have open flued water heaters, we can have open flued fires. We don't have open flued cookers, they're flueless. Anyway, let's start off by having a look at the different components on an open flued boiler. So let's look here. So the first one you're going to see is the primary flue. So what's the primary flue? Well, basically that's built into the appliance where the manufacturer funnels the products of combustion to get ready for going out of the appliance. The next one we've got is the draft diverter. So what's the draft diverter and what does, what does it do? Well, it does three main things, the draft diverter. First of all, if we get downdraft coming down the flue, it will push the products of combustion away from the burner so it doesn't affect the pilot or the burner. Also what it does is, it allows fresh air into the flue system as the boiler is running to dilute the products of combustion. And then finally, it stops excessive flue pull. So if the flue is pulling too much, it might lift off the burner and lift the pilot light, so it breaks that as well. So the draft diverter is incredibly important and it can either be external, like this one, so this is an external draft diverter. So you can see, this is where the flue would be connected and you can see the baffle on the inside. This is where it would be connected to the appliance. And this is where we would do flue flow test and spillage. And if we add excessive pull, then this is where it would be broken. If we need to dilute the air, this is where it comes in. And then if we had downdraft, it would come out here. So that's an external draft diverter, but a lot of them are built into the appliance. So now coming off the draft diverter, the next part of the flue system is the secondary flue. Now the secondary flue is your twin wall flue system, this kind of stuff, so this is twin wall. So we call it twin wall because the internal part is where the products of combustion go, the external part is an air gap. So it stops you getting burnt when you touch it. So this secondary flue, a few things, so you can see here now, we have to have a minimum of 600 mil from the draft diverter to the first bend. Then after that, we've got a, the flue elbows. Now the flue elbows cannot have more of an angle than 45 degrees. We cannot have horizontal length, so we can't have 90 degree elbows, because it will cause problems with the pole and condensation problems, so that's why no horizontal parts. And if you come across boilers now with horizontal parts, or not 600, so the first bend, then uh, it's at risk now on open fluid appliances. So the next thing about this flue system is, it does have to be this twin wall now. We can't have flue liner connecting to an open fluid boiler unless it's a back boiler in a builder's opening. Also in the loft, it can't be flue liner. It has to be a twin wall flue system. We also can't use single wall flue systems now in the loft system. So going to the ridge terminal, it will have to be twin wall pipe, or it's at risk. When you're using this twin wall flue system and you're connecting to the appliance, you must use an appliance adapter. So you're only sealing the inner flue system to the appliance, not the outer flue system. Also, you must follow the arrows on the flue system so you don't install it upside down. Also, you can see the clips. So the maximum clipping distance we can have is every change of direction and no more than 1.8 metres apart. Now a lot of condensing boilers now will give you a maximum spacing of a metre. You need to read the manufacturer's instructions for that, but that's not for twin wall, that's 1.8 metres. 
Now you can see also the minimum length or the minimum height for uh, an open fluid appliance is three meters. The maximum height is um, manufacturer's instructions. So just have a look out for that. Okay, so that's basically the secondary flue. Then finally attached to the secondary flue here at the top is the terminal. Now the slots or the holes in the terminal must allow the passing of a 6mm ball but not a 16mm ball so <laughs> that's where we uh, get with that. So that's the major components of this open flue boiler. We've got the primary flue, we've got the draft diverter, we've got the secondary flue and then we've got the terminal. So now let's have a look on this side here when we're exiting the building let's see what the positions for this open fluid flue pipe needs to be off this boiler. So the first thing you can see is the positioning of the flue off the pitch of the roof and from the side of the flue to the roof on a horizontal plane you need more than 1.5 meters away and at the top here we need to go above the ridge more than 600. So they're the major things you've got to look out for for open fluid appliances when they're exiting through the roof. Also, like this one here, where the minimum height is three meters, here you can see the maximum length you can have outside the property without being insulated is three meters. So if you've got more than three meter length outside, it must be insulated twin wall pipe, not just using the air gap of the twin wall. And like here, where we've got the Velux window. And these measurements are also the same for a room sealed appliance. So if you look at the bottom of the window, we need a two meters without any flue. So you can see the shaded area around there, that's where you're not allowed to have the flue. So 600 to the side, 600 at the top, 600 to the side and two meters down on the bottom. So that rectangle around the window, you're not allowed to put the flue system in there. So that's what you've got to look out for for Velux windows. And like I say, that's also for room sealed appliances. And then finally on this flue system, they uh, need to be at least 25 millimeters away from combustible material. And if you're going through floors, then we'll need fire stops to stop any spread of fire going through there with the flu system. So that's the main things you need to worry about with an open flued boiler. So finally, for fires, open flued fires. Let's have a look here for the size of the flue. So the cross-sectional area for a round flue is 12,000 millimetres squared. And then for the rectangled one, it's 16,500 millimetres squared. Even though I've written metres, it's not metres, it's millimetres. I've missed the M off. Dyslexia. <laughs> The final, final thing on the fires is the maximum flue length which we've got here. So the maximum flue length for a fire internally is 12 metres and externally is 10 metres. But remember if it does go outside and it's longer than 3 metres it still needs to be insulated. So let's switch now from this twin wall flue system to a precast flue. So what is this uh, precast flue system then? Well in the late 1960s, early 1970s when we had a bit of a house building boom, instead of building class one brick chimneys, they decided to do class two chimneys which were um, precast flues. So basically a precast flue system is a load of concrete blocks put on top of each other and uh, goes up to the loft and it's built into the wall. We're going to have a look at it here behind me in a minute. Now a couple of things about this being bonded into the wall. First of all it gave a flat finish so they didn't look like there was a chimney in there anyway. Because it, it was built into the cavity of the wall. The next thing is plastering over it. So you can't just put roughing and finished plaster over a precast flue system. It had to be dot and dabbed. Because if you didn't dot and dab it, it would crack the plaster and lift the blocks. And I've actually seen it done. A few years ago now, I went to a house and you could actually see the blocks all the way through the house up into the loft. 
and the loft extension had been fitted and when we did the flu flow test it all came into the loft where they were kids bedrooms very very naughty so that's the main thing when you're inspecting them you need to be seeing dot and dab not um, finished plaster well roughing and plaster because it will crack the other thing is jointing these blocks together so they would have been built by the bricklayers what the bricklayers should have done was remove the mortar fangs or snots as we like to call them from within inside the chimney because of the very small cross-sectional area of the flue system it would be restricted even more by the fangs and also spiders webs can connect onto it and even reduce it even more so that's the first thing when you're looking up a chimney remember don't use your mince pies use a torch or your phone and a mirror so you can look up there you don't want to be seeing any mortar fangs also the manufacturers came up with this stuff so this is a um, Dunbrick special flue silicone and it's a class 2 gas flue boiler silicone um, 1581 and it's tested by British Gas if that makes any it's a bit hard now anyway that's what you could have used to do the blocks together so they could use this high temperature silicone it's a special silicone just can't use any you've got to use the silicone for the manufacturer's instructions and follow the manufacturer's instructions for it so that's the dumb brick flue um, glue or they could have used fire cement or sand and cement but we've got to make sure there is no mortar fangs snots to you anyway shall we have a look and see what this construction of this flue should be so you can see down here at the bottom we require three starter blocks and also from the top of the outlet of the fire to the bottom of the gather or cover block we needed a 600 mil rise like we do with all open fluid appliances so like i say we go from this three starter blocks to the cover or gather block and what that does then is it funnels it out to the flue blocks and then you can see the flue blocks are bonded so bonded meaning it's built into the brickwork so it doesn't all fall down now if these blocks have to change direction the maximum angle you can have on this flue system is 30 degrees how are you going to see that then <laughs> <laughs> hopefully when they built it but they were especially made blocks anyway so they would have built those angles in there so it would have a maximum ang angle of 30 degrees that's not the twin wall flue system here that's the actual flue blocks so once we get to the top of the flue blocks we then get the transfer block now the transfer block can be two different blocks it can be a straight block where it just comes straight off the top but like this one here is an angled block which then transfers it to the twin wall flue system now when you inspect these in the loft there should be an appliance adapter so that means if you see here the twin wall flue system is actually the inside part of the flue is connected to the appliance then there's an air gap and then there's the outer of the flue so like you would do on an open flue boiler you would have the appliance adapter so you're not connecting the outer of the flue into the blocks and again like all open flue appliances maximum angle of the twin wall flue angle would be 45 degrees and then you can go to the terminal or you can go to a ridge terminal if we've got enough time at the end, I'll sneak in the ridge terminal. So that's basically what you get with the system and how it's put together. Like I say, it's put together by the bricklayers, it's not put together by the engineers. But we still need to inspect them and we need, still need to test them. The flue flow test and spillage is exactly the same as what you would do on any open fluid appliance with a precast flue. So closer and see how big they need to be it's here so as you can see the concrete blocks are made to BS EM 1858 and the cross-sectional area is not less than 16,500 millimeters square with a minimum internal diameter of 90 millimeters so basically what that means is the inside of there so the distance from there to there cannot be less than 90 mil. Should we measure it and find out exactly what this one does? Let's just finish this first. 
But as you can see before 1986, the cross sectional area of the precast flue blocks was 13,000 millimeters squared with a minimum diameter of 63 millimeters inside. So let's quickly measure these blocks and find out what this one is. So you can see this flue block is 185 millimeters long. and has this minimum width of 90 millimeters. So let's do the maths and find out what the cross-sectional area of this flue is then. So let's uh, do the maths with the calculator because you know how rubbish I am. So 185 times 90 gives us a cross-sectional area of 16,650 millimeters squared. So as you can see, it's big enough. Now, first of all, before we look at these measurements behind me here, let's go and have a close look at a ridge terminal and find out exactly what they're all about. So this is the ridge terminal and this is what you would see on the roof. So this is where the products of combustion would come out. But when you're inside the roof, this is what you would see here. And this is the ridge adapter. And the ridge adapter needs to be clamped on either side, have no damage and have a gasket on the inside. So that's what you would uh, see on the outside of a ridge terminal if you've never seen one before. And you would have your flue pipe connected to here. And uh, that's your ridge adapter. So that's all it is. Let's have a look at these measurements here then. So you can see here that the ridge terminal from a structure or another chimney needs to be more than 1.5 meters away so from a wall or from a chimney 1.5 meters away and if you've got two ridge terminals like we've got here then they need to be a minimum of 300 millimeters apart so let's have a look at our first open fluid appliance let's have a look at fires now gas fires now, there's a lot of engineers are scared to death of fires. Don't know why. Love doing a fire. Um, but it's all lack of confidence, I think, and training. If you've been trained on fires, then you find they're not a problem at all. You find lots of faults on fires, but mainly they're one of the easy appliances to work on. So, first thing we would do, like we would do with any appliance when we're servicing, is make sure it turns on. When we're happy with this turn on, we would do the visual inspection. So like, is the half big enough? Is there any signs of scorching? Does the appliance require ventilation? These are the kind of things we're looking at for the visual inspection. Once you're happy with all the visual inspections, we need to remove the fire because we need to do a visual inspection of the flue. So when we're doing a visual inspection of the flue, we need to physically look up the flue. You're not gonna stick your head in there though. You're either gonna use your mobile phone and you're gonna use a mirror and a torch. You're never gonna look up there. Even when you're wearing safety glasses, don't look up a flue because you will get muck in your eye, I guarantee it. So use your phone or use a mirror. Once you're happy with the visuals of the chimney, so it's sealed to marble back, the plaster, but whatever the outside facing is, as long as it's all sealed inside the opening, so no products of combustion can come through the back and then out through into the room. So once you're happy with all that, making sure that the gas pipe coming through is protected. So the gas pipe has got a uh, coating on it, so whether it's plastic coated copper or whether it's got electrical insulation tape on there because that's rated for heat and copper so it won't damage the copper. Uh, and then it's sleeved where it passes through the wall and that the sleeve is sealed. So these are all the visual inspections like you would do with any gas appliance making sure that all the visuals pass. Once you're happy with your visuals you can then do your flue flow test. Now it says in the regulations if your flue is metal and passes outside, preheat it first. Uh, a lot of guys don't preheat the flues first. I always do. Whether it's a brick chimney or whether it's a steel chimney, warm it up first. Check it with a smoke match first before you use a smoke pellet.
when using the smoke pellet make sure that all the smoke goes up the chimney here on this precast flue you can see I'm using a special cup which is designed to hold the smoke pellet hold it at the top of the opening to make sure that the smoke takes the route up the chimney And just remember the smoke pellet must be at least 5 meters cubed of smoke over 30 seconds to use. Then you'll need to go into the bedrooms, you'll need to go in the loft or you need to go outside. So you must remember when you're doing a flu flow test of a chimney you're checking the integrity. So you'll need to make sure you go through the full route. Once you're happy with that and that's all passed, on a service, you remember you might have to clean the catchment space out, you've got to measure the catchment space to make sure it's okay. Then you can put your fire back in. Once you put your fire back in, you can then do all your checks, making sure if it's a radiant fire, the radiants are broken, because remember the radiants are part of the flu system. So you'll be checking any of the radiants. Radiants are broken, it's at risk. Then you would do a spillage test, making sure that all the smoke gets drawn up. If the smoke comes back in, it's failed, it's immediately dangerous. But it does say you can warm it up, for the, the appliance up for another 10 minutes. So when you're doing a spillage test, warm the appliance up for 5 minutes first, then do your first test. If it fails, you can then warm it up for a further 10 minutes. If it fails again, then it's immediately dangerous. The standard stuff you do for gas appliances. Obviously on a service I would clean all the appliance before I put it back together. I would clean the injector, I would clean the burner, I would check the safety devices, making sure if there's an ASD it's working, making sure thermoelectric on the pilot it's working, making sure it turns on and off. Like the standard stuff you would do with any gas appliance when you're servicing. You'd strip and clean it, put it back together and check it to the manufacturer's instructions. Now let's have a look at the safety controls and the safety devices you're going to find in these open fluid appliances. And let's start with my all time favourite, the ones you're going to find in a bat boiler. Multifunctional gas valve. Now then, boilers don't have multifunctional gas valves anymore. But the old type boilers, the atmospheric burners, so this is an atmospheric burner here, they needed a multifunctional control valve. So the components for this multifunctional control valve are, first of all we're starting off with a gas isolation valve. So every gas appliance requires a gas isolation valve. Next thing we come into the, here, which is this grey button, the grey push button, which is the gas control cock. What it does is, again, when we push it in, we're overriding the thermoelectric device and the thermoelectric device is here at the back and you can see the thermocouple going down here. So again, when we press in the button, we're overriding the safety device. We can now use the igniter, the piezo, to, to light it. We can hold the grey push button in for 10 seconds or so we can pull it out and we've now got a pilot. Next part we go from the thermoelectric device we go into the regulator or the governor where we can adjust the pressures. So the old boilers were what are called range rated. Range rated meaning we normally had high, medium and low settings where we could set the burner pressure and setting the burner pressure would set the gas rate. So the higher the burner pressure, the higher the gas rate, the more kilowatts the boiler was giving out. Okay, we'll have a look at that in a minute. We then went to a solenoid valve, and the solenoid valve is operated by an electrical thermostat. And this is the electrical thermostat here. Now, unlike a cooker where it's a mechanical thermostat, this is actually connected to the electrical supply here. So first of all, I've got to make sure my control knob is turned off, and I can now turn my power on. So I've got my thermocouple lit, so what I can do now is, when I turn my electrical thermostat on, you'll hear a click, which is a solenoid valve, and you can now see the gas burner is lit. Now the gas comes in at this end here. So this gap here is where the air comes in for combustion. It then, your 50% pre-air, mixes with the gas. It lights at this end and burns back to the injector. So basically this is the 
the boiler knows it's completely lit because there's no control for this. The only control is the thermocouple. Now, if you've got an explosive ignition on this, normally what it would be would be the thermocouple flame would be tiny and wouldn't be enough to light it. So we get a build up of gas and we get explosive mixture. Now, if you did have a small pilot flame, one of the things you can do is use this adjuster here to increase it. So if I screw it to the left, you should see the flame increases and if I screw it inwards you should see the flame decrease so that is your pilot adjuster but you would only do that if it was all cleaned and wasn't being blocked up with anything so that's how you would do, adjust the pilot if you had a lazy pilot so the thermocouple works the same as it does in the fire exactly the same so again two dissimilar metals uh, creating this 12 to 30 millivolts um, keeping the electron magnet open okay now again if I blow that thermocouple out I've got within 60 seconds for it to click out but this is off a back boiler and a lot of the old uh, flow standing open fluid boilers the, you couldn't blow the pilot flame out so on the control cot basically what we could do is we could turn it, so we could turn it clockwise and the pilot would go out. Now we would start the timer and we would be waiting for the click, but no, I can't push the button back in until this click has happened. So I'm still pushing it in, still nothing yet. Let's wait for that click. There you go. We can now press the grey button in and the pilot flame lights again. Again, I can hold it in for 10 seconds. Now then, the other thing is, once we've checked the thermoelectric, we need to see whether it's passing or not. So with a cooker, you can normally hear it and smell it. With a fire, it's pretty much the same. And you could use a naked flame then to see if it is actually passing the thermoelectric. Now we need to test and see whether our thermoelectric device is actually passing. So we've blown it out, we've heard the click, but we don't know whether our thermoelectric's passing because we can't smell it, we can't see it, we can't put any naked flames on it. So the way we do it is, first of all, what we need to do is, I need to level and zero my digital manometer. So I've done that. And I have an inlet test point here. So I can now open the inlet test point and I can now connect my hose onto the inlet test point. So I have now got an inlet pressure of 23.7 millibars. Well that's with the pilot going. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to blow out the pilot flame and when I hear the click I'm going to turn off the gas supply. What that's going to do is, it's going to trap the gas within the uh, multifunctional gas valve and not allow gas in. So if there is a leak on the thermoelectric, our pressure should start dropping on the gauge. So let's have a go at that now. So first of all, I'm going to blow out the pilot flame. And now once I've got the click, I'm going to turn off my gas supply, but I'm not going to turn it off until I hear the click. Once I turn, the, turn it off, then it should trap this gas in there. And if we do have the thermoelectric passing, the pressure should go down on that gauge. Okay, so the thermoelectric's kicked in. I'm now going to see if this drops down. And at the moment it's reading 24.1 millibars. It's now reading 24.2. But it's not going down. So that means the gas what's trapped within the multifunctional valve is not leaking through the thermoelectric device. So that proves the thermoelectric device has slammed shut. When you made that click it turned off and it's not passing through the pilot flame. So that's a good test so we can turn that back on now. Okay and now should be able to light my pilot which it does. 
Now, the last um, safety device control I want to look at on a bat boiler is this thing. And this is what's called the sniffer tube. So basically what this does is, the air for combustion from a bat boiler comes from the front of the, the unit and then it gets drawn in through the burner. But also what it does is, because the draft diverter is here, the air also gets drawn in to dilute the products of combustion and to aid the flu flow. Now, what they've done is they put the sniffer tube into the hood of the uh, draft diverter. So it draws its air for combustion from the ASD from the hood of the bat boiler. So if the hood got vitiated, so we had downdraft, we had um, incomplete combustion, then this would get vitiated. It then wouldn't supply enough oxygen to the um, ASD um, and would knock out. So this is actually an ODS, an oxygen depletion system. So this is a sniffer tube. And the way you would test that would be with the appliance running, you would stick your finger over the sniffer tube and it would knock your pilot off, which would make your thermoelectric cool down, which again would knock off your thermoelectric. So sniffer tube, that's how we test it and that's what it does. So if you see them in a Baxi bat boiler, because they're only in the Baxi Bermuda bat boilers in the last line of bat boilers, that's what you would test the sniffer tube. So let's have a look and see how this electrical thermostat works. Now this is what it looks like inside this electrical thermostat. So basically what you can see here is where the live wires come in. So this is where your live supply comes, then your neutral, then your earth. So this is your power supply coming in. Now this black wire you can see coming off here, this is what attaches to the solenoid valve. So this is one side of the solenoid valve. Okay, because this is a 230 volts, we need a live and we need a neutral. But if you can see how it's been wired, basically, when the live comes in, it's going through this switch here. And this is the control knob on the front. So basically, we're only switching the live wire to the solenoid valve. This is the um, file. Okay, the temperature file, which is connected on above the switch. So that also breaks the live supply. So the neutral is going straight to the um, solenoid valve. The earth is going to the solenoid valve. Okay, but the live is always switching. That's pretty much what we're doing. We're just switching. This is the earth connection here. So it's connect. It's because this is made of metal. It's making this earth as well. So that's all it looks like on the inside. So basically when this does operate, you're only switching the live wire, not the neutral. So let's have a look and see this in action. Let's see it working in action. So first of all, I'm going to turn it on. So now I've got the turn on. And now we've got here, this is the file, pretty much the same what's in a liquid vapor, pretty much what's same in a mechanical thermostat. It's filled with alcohol, okay? So I'm just gonna put this over the flame here. Once it gets up to temperature, it will knock off, but this would actually be installed in the water side, in a dry pocket. So this would be detecting the water temperature, not the flame temperature. But I am gonna use the flame temperature to simulate it. So what should happen now is it should get up to temperature and it should knock the gas supply off. Straight away, it's knocked it off. So if I move this away from the gas supply now, I'm not touching the thermostat. And what should happen now is that should cool down and the burner should come back on. This may take a few seconds. So as soon as that cools down, as soon as it goes back into a liquid rather than vapor, there you go, it's back on. And you can see it's automatically brought on. But remember, this would be in the water side, not in the um, flame side. There's no control for the, the flame side, only your burner pressure. Let's have a look at the burner pressure. Now what I've done is I've connected another digital manometer onto the test point where we would take burner pressure. So we've got our inlet pressure 
of 23.6 millibars and we've got a burner pressure well it's reading not 0.2 but that's just because I put it on now then when I turn it on that should change now I've got this set to around about three uh, millibars so let's see what it goes up to 3.1 3.1 3.2 .1, it's flickering through so what's that doing now is that's picking up my burner pressure now if I wanted to adjust that burner pressure what I would have to do is, first of all, I would have to take the dust cap off the front of the uh, regulator. Now, if I screw the regulator in, my pressure should go up on my gauge and the flame should rise. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to give it a quarter of a turn. And what I've done now is, you can see the flame's gone higher and it's actually gone up to 5.8 millibars now if I turn it back quarter of a turn we should get back to this 3 millibars so I'm screwing it anti-clockwise now and that will reduce the gas going in so it's now reading 3.4 just need to go a little bit more 3.3 only tiny little turns 3.1 back where we were when we started so if I screw the regulator in it increases the gas flow so it gives you more gas going through to the burner which would increase your gas rate and if I screw it to the left so anti-clockwise that would then decrease the pressure on the spring which would decrease my gas flow which would decrease my kilowatts so that's how I would adjust the regulator and that's how the regulator works so that's a multifunctional control valve first thing i'm going to do is i'm going to test the safety device here so first i need to light it so i've lit the pilot hold it for a few seconds and then i can let go right so the first test i'm going to do is i'm going to blow the pilot light out i'm going to time how long it takes to click so let me get the watch ready about 16 seconds so it has 30 seconds to knock out so that's the first thing we're going to do I'm now going to relight it so what I've done is I've removed the lint arrestor from around the pilot assembly and I've, I know exactly where the hole is for the pilot assembly here and I'm going to check now the ASD so I'm just going to put my finger in here, if I can get my hand in, and I'm going to block off the ASD, and again, it should knock off. So you can see the incomplete combustion there, so this is what would happen if the air got vitiated. And there you go, VSD knocked off. I don't know how long that was because my watch is on my right hand and I can only get my right hand in here. <laughs> so it was well within 60 seconds, but there you go. So that's checking. I need to put the lint arrestor back now. But that's checking the um, pilot light. Okay, so that's checking the thermal electric device and it's checking the ASD. Another way guys do it is, which I don't really get, but there you go. Because they will get the screwdriver and they will block off the port going to the thermocouple. And what that does is it shows them also that the gas is knocked out. So that's another way of doing it. I don't do it that way. I'll blow it out because you can hear the pilot and you can hear the gas coming out. So that's how you check the safety devices on this fire. So if you are having your fire serviced, you're a customer, the gas engineer will need to check the safety devices because they are incredibly important. 
Now that's all the uh, controls, let's have a look now at flue gas analysing the different appliances. Let's start with the open flue boiler first. Now when you're flue gas analysing an open flue appliance, we can't be going drilling holes in the top of the flue and putting our probe in there. Oh, oh no, because you just made the flue ID, the products of combustion are coming out, because you've just broken the integrity of the flue. So you do not drill holes in this flue. And if there are, if there is a hole in the flue, someone's put some tape over it, because it should be twin wall flue system coming off the top of an open flue boiler. This is a training centre, this is the wrong flue system. So if you've got single wall, that makes it at risk. And if you've got damaged flue with a hole in it, it's at risk. And if products of combustion are coming out of it, it's ID. So never drill a hole in the flue for a flue gas analyzer test port. Because what you're supposed to do is take your probe and you can actually get some extension pieces. Um, I have got an extension piece here, or you can have it made, but you have to slide it up the flue, and so you're inside here, and you're sampling up the back of the draft diverter. So you come in at the back of the draft diverter, find the flue hole, there you go, I'm in. So I'm now in the flue ways, and it says to be about 100 mil into the flue way. And my hand is still down at the bottom. So if this was in a compartment, um, you would have to have the door of the compartment shut as well when you're flue gas analysing it. So open flue the places, you'll be flue gas analysing this on maximum, because there ain't no minimum setting, and you'll be looking for a ratio of less than 0.008. And if you didn't get that, you'll be at risking it, stripping it, cleaning it, whatever we would need to do to get that ratio down. But the main problems we find with open fluid appliances is people drill holes into the fluid system to take the sample. No. Up the back of the draft diving. Let's have a look at fires. Now, when we come to a radiant fire to flue gas analyse, <laughs> there's nowhere to do it. So, we can't flue gas analyse a radiant fire. Unless you're going to get on the roof and do it from the, from the chimney. Because there's no way of getting a probe inside. These weren't designed for flue gas analyzing. But, sweep testing. We should still be sweep testing around the appliance. Remember, 100 mil away from the appliance and sweeping around the appliance for that two minute test. Also, the open flue boiler behind me, sweep test on that as well. Taking in particular care around the draft diverter. So it says sweep around the bottom of the draft diverter around any seals where you would take away, you would remove for servicing. So this fire, hmm, no flue gas analysing on this one, but we can do the sweep test. So let's have a look at an inset life fuel effect. When you're flue gas analysing the inset life fuel effect fire, it says to put the probe into the flue this way. Obviously the fire needs to be running. I'm not putting the fire on because I'll be burning my hand but you need again the extension probe to be able to be like here but you have to get right in 100 mil through the uh, spigot hole at the back here so underneath there so it needs to go right the way in so obviously I'll be getting burnt now if I have this on so again you need the extension probe to be able to analyze this fire now the ratios we're looking for for this fire is 0.02 or unless the manufacturers give you an actual reading which I doubt because they weren't made for analysing. So that's what we're looking for, 0.02 and that's your CO, CO2 ratio. But again, sweep test afterwards, says 100ml in front of the fire. So that's flue gas analysing the inset live fuel effect fire. So that's flue gas analysing all the different types of open fluid appliances we can do. So let's have a look at uh, every training gas engineer's favourite. Let's have a look at ventilation. Now let's talk about the basics for ventilation first. So BS5440 part 2 is uh, all about ventilation and that's for appliances not exceeding 70 kilowatts net. That's important. The building regulations we're going to be referring to is building regulation part F for ventilation. 
And the way I've always told people to remember that is F for ventilation. It works, trust me. <laughs> Uh, we can also look at the gas safety installation and use regulations, so we can check on them. They were updated only two years ago. And basically what ventilation is, it's split up into different appliances. So we've got open fluid appliances, we've got room sealed appliances, and we've got flueless appliances. Now, adventitious ventilation. What is that? Well, basically, adventitious ventilation is the free air we've got in a room coming through the windows, coming through the doors, coming through the floors. So they say in houses built before 2008, we could have up to seven kilowatts of free air in there. After 2008, because of double glazing, loft insulation, floor insulation, then we can't take this advantageous ventilation. How do we get to this advantageous ventilation? Well, we need five centimeters squared of free air per kilowatt over this seven. So if we do five times seven, that's 35 centimeters squared. So advantageous ventilation actually comes out at 35 centimeters squared. So for open fluid appliances, the first seven kilowatts is free. So let's have an example of putting this into some kind of context. So we've got a 30 kilowatt gross boiler open fluid installed in a room. That question is telling you one, what the kilowatts is, whether it's gross or net, two, where it's installed, and three, what type of appliance is it? So from that description, we can work out what we need. So because we know it's gross, the first thing we need to do is turn it to net. Because since 2000, we've always used the net figure. I remember it well, I remember it changing over. So if we have 30 divided by 1.11, because turning gross to net is 1.11 for natural gas, it comes out that we need 27.02 kilowatts to find the ventilation for it. So 27.02 minus this advantageous air of 7 kilowatts comes out at 20.02 kilowatts. And then we need to take this 20.02 and times it by 5, which gives us 100.13 centimetres squared of free air as a minimum. And we could round that up to 101 centimetres squared to give it a full figure. Now then, let's talk about multiple appliances. Open fluid appliances, remember. So, in this house we have two 30 kilowatt net open fluid boilers. We've got one 6.9 kilowatt net open fluid fire. And they are installed in a room. So the question has told us all the information we need. It's net. So it's not gross, so it doesn't need to be turned to net, so we don't need to do the divide by 1.11. And it's installed in a room. So we have 30 plus 30 plus 6.9 is 66.9 kilowatts net. Now then, what we can do now is minus the 7. So we don't minus the 7 for each individual appliance because you can only add advantageous air for one appliance. So even if you had two or just two appliances, you would add them together and minus the seven, not minus seven for both appliances. So then we would have 55.9 kilowatts, 59.9 kilowatts times five, because remember you need five centimeters squared of free air per kilowatt, gives us 299.5 centimeters squared of free air, or you could round it up to 300. So that is the ventilation for multiple appliances. The same appliances, open fluid. Now let's go one step further. Let's get a little bit more technical. So this is one appliance installed away from the vent. So it's in a room further away from the actual outside vent. So this is the outside and these are the two rooms. Now then, couple of things. First thing, always try and install an outside vent high up so it doesn't blow cold air over the customer so the customer doesn't block it. That's the first one. Next one is the vent has a minimum height off the floor. So the bottom of the vent to the floor level 
don't put them in lower than 300 because you could get snow, rain, leaves blocking them. Now, what we've got here is the path of the air coming in for combustion. Now, you know, this vent is low down and this is the wall separating the two rooms. And we cannot go higher than 450 mil off the floor because you don't want to spread smoke in a fire. So that will keep the fresh air low down. So we have a 30 kilowatt boiler here, but it's 30 kilowatt net. So it's what we've just done. It's 30 minus a 7 times 5 is 115 centimetres squared. So vent 1 is 115 centimetres squared and vent 2 is 115 centimetres squared. Okay, so pretty straightforward with that one again. Now, if we go to our more rooms, we need to install the vents 50% larger than the outside vent. So vent 1 is for the 30 kilowatt boiler, so vent 1 will be 115 centimetres squared. Vents 2 and 3 will be 50% bigger than vent 1. Not 50% bigger than each other, 50% bigger than vent 1. So they would be 172.5 centimetres squared. So 115 for 1 and 172.5 for vents 2 and 3. So how did we get there then? So let's do the example. So we've got 30 kilowatt net minus a 7 because we're in a room is 23 kilowatts times the 5, that's where we get the 115. And the way I work out the 50% bigger, because maths ain't my strong point, if you've watched any of my videos, you know, spelling and maths. So 115 divided by 2 is 57.5, then add on the 115, so it comes to 172.5 centimetres squared. So let's have a look at this compartment ventilation and we'll continue with open fluid appliances. So we've got this scenario first, we've got a room and a compartment, we've got this open fluid boiler installed in the compartment but we're taking our ventilation from the room. So we'll need a vent from outside to bring the fresh air into the room. And because this boiler is installed in a compartment, we require two vents. We need a low level vent and a high level vent. Now the low level vent brings the air in for combustion and the high level vent gets rid of the warm air. It does actually help a little bit with bringing air in for combustion but it's mainly there for cooling. Now a couple of things different to open fluid appliances being installed in rooms to being installed in a compartment. Now, as you've seen in the first one, if it's installed in a room, we are allowed to deduct advantageous air. When the boiler's installed in a compartment, you don't minus the advantageous air or the 7 kilowatts. So, again, we've got our 30 kilowatt net boiler installed in this compartment. So, we require three vents. So, the vent outside, so vent number one, is our normal vent. So, it's 30 minus 7 times 5 is 115 centimetres squared. So that's normal. When it comes to these 2 and 3 vents, so vent 2 is a high level vent, remember we don't minus a 7 and this figure is already a net figure, so we don't need to divide by 1.11. So vent 2 is 30 times 10, which is 300 centimetres squared. And the bottom one is 30 times 20, which is 600 centimetres squared. So there are a couple of big holes. So that's, in a nutshell, ventilation for an open fluid boiler in a compartment. We need to times the kilowatts net by 20 for low level vent and 10 for the high level vent. Let's up a notch and look at it passing through two or more rooms. So if it passed just through one room, like we did before, it would be this one. If we pass through two rooms and then into the compartment, we just need the vents to be the same. So passing through, but because we're going through two or more rooms, vents two and three 
need to be increased by 50% from the outside vendor. So again, if we look at this scenario, it's the same boiler, it's a 30 kilowatt net. Vent number one, which is the outside vent, again will be 30, minus the seven times the five is 115. Vents two and three, as we say here, need to be 50% bigger than vent one. So it's 115 divided by two, plus the 115 is 172.5. Vent three is the same, 15 divided by two, plus 115 is 172.5. And then vents four and five, four being the high, five being the low is the same as above. We're just timesing it by 10 and 20. So that's open fluid appliances installed in a compartment taking the air from within a room. Let's have a look and see when they're taking it directly from outside. So let's have a look at these two different scenarios we've got now. So this again is an open fluid boiler taking its air direct from outside. So we don't need three vents, we only need two. It's a 24 kilowatt gross boiler now. So we need to do the 24 divided by 1.11 is 21.62 kilowatts. Then we need for the top vent, because it's for cooling, we need to times it by five. So it's 21.62 times five is 108.1 centimeter squared. So that's your top vent, which is just mainly for cooling. Now your bottom vent, vent which is for combustion, so you've got 24 divided by 1.11 again is 21.62 because we're turning gross to net. And then we've got 21.62 times 10 this time, which is 216.2 centimetres squared. So if you're taking your air from direct outside, the vents are smaller and you only need two. Now that is the end of part two on Everything training gas engineers need to know about appliance flues. <laughs> so if you've liked this video, why don't you give me a thumbs up or leave a constructive comment down below. If you've not subscribed to my channel, then please subscribe because it helps. And don't forget to hit that notification bell because you want YouTube to tell you when we're uploading videos. Yeah, Mondays and Wednesdays. All I've got left to say is, thanks for listening. Thanks for watching and I'll catch you on part three guys, which is all about room seal appliances. Cheers.